to do with every breath I'm praising you desire of the nations and every heart you alone are God you alone are God you are the Lord the famous one
praise the Lord. Father God, we thank you this morning for who you are. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. Lord God, you are all powerful. You are all loving. Your grace and your mercy abide. And we just thank and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. We have uh, the privilege of having Chuck Fanberg with us this morning. Chuck has been a missionary to Central America for many years, most recently serving in Costa Rica. So Chuck, why don't you come on up and share with us? Uh, Chuck has some fabulous stories. I'm not sure which stories he's going to engage us with here this morning. Uh, but between now and then following the service, our normal small group time is going to be here. For the adult small groups, we're going to be meeting in here. So just to clarify that, because Chuck has some more things he's going to share with us at that time. Chuck? It is a joy for me to be able to be with you here in Little Falls and uh, worship with you and be able to share with you this morning. It is always great to be in a church where people say, I love this church. And uh, you have a very warm congregation here. I can just tell that for the greetings I received this morning, and it's a joy to share with you this morning. Let's pray before we begin. Father God, we thank you for this day. It is a privilege that we have to be able to come to a church and worship freely. So many in the world do not have that privilege. We thank you for it. This morning we're going to open your word. We ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts so that we might be able to receive from it. I ask that you anoint the lips of your servant so that your word is shared faithfully this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pedro stood and gazed into that hardware store window in that little mall in Valencia, Venezuela. He had come to that same spot on Sunday morning for the last at least four or five Sundays. At this time, he had stood there and gazed into that hardware store window. He didn't want anyone to know what he was doing. See, he wasn't interested in anything that was in that window. He was really paying attention to what was going on over to his right. Because right over there, just about 20 or 30 feet away, was what we called the little church in the mall. It was where our Alliance missionaries had begun a church in, the, in this valley where there were some 50,000 people had come, and there was no place to even rent for a church except for this little tiny place in a mall. It was so small that it was, well, the space was from this corner to the wall, from me to the wall, and about that deep. That was the church. And there was no room to put chairs, so the chairs were put out into the aisle of the mall. It was like worshiping in a fishbowl. And Pedro, one Sunday, had come to the mall to buy some hardware, screws or nails or who knows what, but he had noticed these people sitting there, and he stopped and listened. And Pedro's life was a mess. But that day what he heard was a message of hope. And so he'd gone back the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. And the missionary that was speaking was the pastor of the church. Some of you might know him. His name is Herb Garland. He was a missionary from our district. Had seen Pedro there, and he knew that there was a reason that Pedro had come each Sunday, and it wasn't to buy hardware. And that Sunday, as Pedro listened, they gave a call and said, if you would like to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we'd like to tell you how you can do that. And Pedro responded and gave his life to Jesus. Pedro had grown up in a country where he had access to at least the name of Jesus. In Venezuela, everybody has heard the name of Jesus. It's part of the culture. But he'd never heard about a personal relationship with Jesus and how that changes one's life and the hope that we have. 
Pedro lived in a country where everyone had heard about Jesus. Dave, like many Alliance missionaries, minister in a country where few people hear about Jesus. In fact, uh, Pedro, it took him just a few encounters with the gospel because he had already heard about Jesus for him to be able to respond. Some of our missionaries tell us that they work in places where a person needs at least 100 count encounters with the gospel message and Christian love before they're even able to begin to consider Jesus as their Savior. Dave works in one such country, a country in Central Asia. It's what we call a limited access country, so we cannot even tell you what country he lives in because Dave is not allowed to talk about Jesus in that country publicly. Even privately, it's dangerous. One slip of the tongue to the wrong person and David and his family would be out of the country within just a couple of days. He's not there as a missionary. They won't allow missionaries to enter that country. So he's gone in as just a person to live the Christian life and somehow bring access to the gospel to those people. How would you do that? Well, Dave and his family, they went there and they studied the language for a year. They had language classes and a tutor and all that, and they worked with that. And they were getting a little bit of grasp of the language. And so Dave decided in the second year, he thought, well, I need more language and I'd like to get to know people better and get to know the culture. And so he decided to enroll in a, sem in a, a university class and study philosophy of all things when he's new in the language. And so he began to take this philosophy class in the university there. And uh, he would go and he'd, he'd do his best in trying to understand and even participate a little bit in the class. And then one day his professor came up to him. His professor had no idea why Dave was there. He was this American guy, you know, what are you doing here? But uh, he went up to Dave and he said, Dave, he said, next week our class is to have the discussion about the philosopher Dante. And the, the discussion is to be about his poem, Inferno. And he said, Dave, he said, that poem has never been translated into our language. And I don't really understand English very well to read it. He said, would you be willing to teach our class next week about Dante's poem, Inferno. And Dave hesitated for a moment. He knew that the language was going to be very difficult. But he said, I'm here looking for opportunities. And so he said, all right, I'll do it. So Dave went home and he, and he began to read Dante's Inferno. And Dante's Inferno is a story about the travel of the sinner going into hell and paying for his sins. Obviously, the theology isn't quite all in line with our theology, but the sinner goes into hell and he has to pay for all of his sins. And at the end of it, the conclusion is the way out of hell is through Jesus Christ. And Dave, when he looked at that, he said, I can't teach that. What am I going to do? And he prayed about it, and he just felt the Spirit of God saying to him, I put you here for a reason, to give you an opportunity to give access to the gospel to these people. It may be the last opportunity you get, but you'll give access to the gospel to somebody. And so Dave went to class, and he taught it just as Dante had written it, and concluded by telling them that the way out of punishment and hell is through Jesus Christ. And when he was done, the professor came up to him and said, Dave, that was wonderful. 
would you be willing to teach my next section in the afternoon the same thing? And that day, Dave had the opportunity to give the first time access, the first time hearing the name of Jesus to 80 students in that university. 80 inquisitive students heard about Jesus. And he is the way to salvation. You see, God wants all peoples to have access to the gospel. That is what my wife and I and our family has been involved in. I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are, my wife Robbie and I, and our family. We have three children, two sons, a daughter, two daughters-in-law, a son-in-law, and four grandchildren. And uh, God has blessed us, uh, each one of them serving the Lord, and we're just very thankful for that. And we serve with the Christian Missionary Alliance. As you know about the Alliance, there's more than 2,000 churches here in the U.S. Uh, A third of them are ethnic churches. I've already had the privilege of being in an ethnic church this, this year, about a month ago. I was in the Ethiopian church in Minneapolis. What a wonderful experience that was, worshiping with them. I didn't understand anything that was said until I spoke. And they translated it, but it was a wonderful experience. That's who we are in the Alliance. We have more than 700 uh, missionaries or international workers, we're called, serving around the world in currently uh, around some 70 peoples. And so the Alliance is uh, around the world, and you can hear more about us. Uh, You have access to the Internet. Go on our webpage, cmalliance.org, and you can find out all about the Alliance. And so that's who we are. And uh, I would like to share with you today a little bit of how we work in the Alliance and what part my wife and I and our family have had in serving the Alliance around the world. And I'd like to be- begin this by telling about who we are and how that fits with God's story. You see, God's story begins in Genesis chapter 12 where God comes to Abraham and says to Abraham, I want to make of you a great nation And you're going to be a blessing to all peoples. You see, God is already connecting with his people, with his his creation. And then we we go to the end of the story in Revelation chapter 7. And we find that the conclusion of the story, so we see how it's all going to end. And what a great image is given to us by the Apostle John. And when he receives in a vision, he sees heaven. He sees the throne of God. And what does he see there? He sees people from every language, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. They're all included, and they are there bowed before the throne of God. And so we have the beginning, and we have the end. And then in between, we have the key to how that all comes about. As we read about Simeon blessing the baby Jesus, he recognizes that this is not just any baby. It is God's provision. And he declares, you are going to be the light of the world. The Gentiles are going to come to know God through you as well as Israel. And so we have the beginning of the story, God wants to bless all peoples. We have the end of the story that shows how that all comes to about and then we have in the middle of the story that says this is the key, this is how it happens. And that is how it happens is through Jesus Christ. Today, even in our evangelical churches, that message is getting lost. As there are people who are saying, Well, isn't this good enough? And isn't this good enough? And isn't this good enough? And the answer is no. The Bible is very clear. Jesus was very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There is no other way. And unless we bring people the name of Jesus, they will not know God in a true manner, and they will not know his salvation. And so God desires that all people gain access to the gospel. He wants us to get out the message and he is with us in it. 
One of our international workers served in the country of Burkina Faso in eastern Afri- Western Africa. And he was invited to give a meditation at the, in the chapel of the local hospital. And so each week he would go and give his meditation. And then he had to be gone for a few weeks. And uh, after he, that period of time, he returned and, and said, I'm back. I can give the devotional again this week if you'd like. And they said, yeah, that'd be great. And so he gave his meditation. And following his meditation, a man came up to him and said, oh, I'm so glad that you've come back. He said, I've come to depend upon your messages. He said, because I'm the imam here in the local mosque, and I would come every week, and I would listen to you, and then I'd have something to say to my people. (laughs) You see, God is going to get out the message one way or another, and he just asks us to be involved in it. We never even know how it's going to happen, but God's going to do it. He declared, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. And he called us to take part in it. He said, go and make disciples. He commanded us. My wife and I responded to that call. And I'd like to tell you the most recent way that we've been seeking to bring gospel access to people. We have served in the countries of Venezuela and Peru, In Peru, we served for 10 years until we had finished our work as a mission. We were among the last of the Alliance missionaries to work there. And the mission said, we are done. The church is strong. It's time to go and move on. And so we ended up in Costa Rica. And in Costa Rica and Central America, actually all of Central America, and and we began to assess and we saw the needs. And one of the needs in Costa Rica, we were placed to live there. We went to the National Church president, and we noticed the National Church had not been opening churches. They were just kind of maintaining. And so we felt, how can we encourage them to begin planting churches, to give access to more people to the gospel? We went to the National Church president and said, this is our vision. Where should we start? And he said, well, you know what? Over on the western edge of the city of San Jose, the capital, he said, There's really not many churches over there. It's the area of Escazú. So we went over to Escazú, and we began looking, and we drove around, and area of some 20,000 people, not one visible evangelical church. We began to investigate. Escazú is, well, it's referred to as the Beverly Hills of Costa Rica. It's where the people of Affluence and influence live. They drive very nice cars. They live in very nice condominiums or homes. The people live in gated communities or behind walls. You can't go up to the door and talk to them because you can't get to the door. And if they respond, it'll be the maid that'll talk to you, or the guard for their house or their condominium. And you can't get to know them in the shopping mall or anywhere else. It's it's a closed community. The only way you make a friend in Escazú is if someone that is part of that community introduces you to them. And so we looked and we said, how do we make that first friend? Well, God laid on my wife's heart a vision. A vision to start a coffee shop. I guess I'm a little bit behind here. I always forget these things. (laughs) A coffee shop. We called it Dulce Refugio. That means sweet refuge. A place where people would come. We would serve them. We would amplify Christian love, and we would begin to form a relationship with them over time. A slower process, but it, we felt this was a way that God laid on our hearts. And so we began the work of the Dulce Refugio coffee shop, a very beautiful coffee shop, very appropriate for the people we were trying to reach. God provided the funds through 
mostly through churches here in our district. And we began the Dulce Refugio coffee shop, and people came in, and we began to get to know them. We began to get some regular customers. We began to have some opportunities to share our faith in a very limited level and talk to them about their faith and, and the differences that we might have. And we were at that for about a year and a half, a little bit more. And my wife noticed she was getting tired, and I noticed that, and then she was having troubles breathing, and so I went to the doctor. And after some tests, they came back and they said, you have advanced lung cancer, stage four lung cancer. And uh, four days later, we were on an airplane back to the U.S., and we were asking God, we've invested so much, why did this happen? We were able to leave the coffee shop in the hands of some others that were there working with us, but we were asking God why while we were sitting on that plane. And we didn't know that while we were in the air, that a couple of men walked into the coffee shop looking to talk to me. They said they'd heard that I was there, and they said, we've heard about this place, and we want to talk to Chuck about it, and the possibility of working together. They explained that they were a, a, a pastor, a businessman, and a couple of businessmen that had opened a church right there in Escasu, a small group, and they'd come to realize they needed to work together with someone because it was hard. And he said, we, we were just hoping that we could talk and maybe we could work partner. Right. You see, God was bringing the answer even when we were asking the question before that. See, Apostle Paul went through difficult times and he said, you know what? I found out that in the midst of this, that God was at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be proclaimed and that all might hear about Jesus. And since that time, I've been able to go back to Costa Rica. We've formed that relationship. We are working with that small congregation because we work with the Alliance. We have often some resources available. Our regional director, actually had planned a visit for the end of that week after we just left on Tuesday. He was there on Friday, and he already had the plane tickets, so he went anyway and talked with our uh, interns that we had working there, and, and they connected him up with this pastor and began the relationship, and things built, and I said, you know, we talked about it, and he said, what can we do? And I said, we need someone in there. He said, I have one possibility. So he went back to Uruguay, and he talked to uh, Tom and Christina Froelich. Tom and Christina Froelich were selling almost all of their earthly goods they had. They lived in Uruguay for at least a dozen years, reaching out to upper-middle-class professional people just like the ones we were trying to reach in Escasu. Tom and Tina were returning to the U.S. to retire. And our regional director went to them and said, would you be willing to stop in Costa Rica for a year before you retire? And they accepted that. And so two weeks before they were ready to retire from their missionary service, they accepted the call to go to Costa Rica. And they arrived there they knew about working with people in the upper middle class. They were fluent in the language. Tom is a theologian and a philosopher, and so he was able to connect with people on a level that they were used to talking. And he began the things that, all those things that we had planned, we were just ready to launch new things. Tom was able to step in and do it. He opened up English classes now with, the class, with, with uh, some of our regular customers. And, and he began to work with that new church plant and, and train their leaders how to do cell groups. And since then, I just met with the pastor 
a few weeks ago. He said the church has nearly doubled in size. The cell groups have multiplied because of what Tom was able to teach them. They have outgrown their space, which is okay, because two weeks ago, the government came to them and said, you can't meet here anymore because this isn't a church building. They were meeting in his furniture showroom. He's a businessman. He has a, builds furniture. He has a big furniture showroom. They'd move all the furniture out and worship in that space. But for church, all the cars now on the street, the people were complaining about. The music, they're a little loud in Latin America. The neighbors were complaining about the music, and they'd complained enough, and the government said, no, nope, no more. You can't meet here anymore. And so now we're asking God to provide them a new place to meet. I don't know this week what's happening, where they're meeting. We're just trusting God to provide. But you see, God had a plan. He wants all the people of Eskasu to have access to the gospel in terms of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he's already planned that out for us. So how do you see the world? Boy, we listen to the news today. Things don't sound good. In fact, they sound, seem like worse every day. The latest is Russia is talking about nuclear war. If you haven't heard that. The news isn't good. Do we live with a bad news perspective that everything's going bad? Or do we live with a good news perspective? You see, we have people that have been displaced in areas like Syria. Refugees leaving that country by the hundreds of thousands. Some of them come into our country. They don't speak our language. They don't dress like us. And they aren't Christians. And there's certainly a political aspect to this, and I believe that the Bible teaches that the government has a role to protect us. But on the other side of it, there's the Christian aspect. And we are to bring gospel access to each of these people. And God is bringing some of them to us. And one of the things that we find is that people in transition, people particularly whose lives have been erupted are the most open to the gospel. And God has opened hundreds of thousands of people to the possibility of considering his message. And he's bringing them, some of them here, where they ought to hear it loudly and clearly. Some of them are going to take a hundred encounters with Christian love and hearing the Christian message before they're really open to considering Jesus. Will you be faithful in taking part in that? So what does it mean to fulfill the Great Commission? It means that all peoples have access to the message of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And how do we do that in the Alliance? We do that, first of all, by doing what Dave did, by going from the outside into a place where the name of Jesus is not known and sharing the gospel. It's done like the missionary that went into Valencia, Venezuela, and shared the gospel with Pedro so that a church could be built there. And then once that church is built, we begin to have those that work on the inside, Actually, when I knew Pedro, first met Pedro, he had been discipled in the church. And he was already a leader in the church and bringing other people to Jesus Christ. You see, that's what the church is about. And then, to fulfill the Great Commission, we have those who are the inside begin to build church networks to work together to bring gospel to reach others beyond themselves. And so the Alliance 
starts by going from the outside to build up a church. That church partners together with us to reach others, sending others to go from the outside to build a church in new areas. And we in the Alliance have established a gospel presence in many countries of the world, somewhere in the area of 100 countries in the world. Now I'm gaining gospel access through the Alliance. We are currently working in many areas of the world where we have international workers. And we have some 52 countries that are considered part of our missions network in the Alliance World Fellowship. And at this point, 22 of those countries are sending their missionaries going from the outside to bring gospel to those who have never heard. And one of the great things about that is many of those can go places where we as Americans cannot go, where a U.S. passport is not welcome, where we are considered a threat. They are received. And God is opening new opportunities around the world as we partner with our partner churches in the alliance around the world. And so we have a focus that is on that area of the most unreached. The second largest religion in the world is Islam. And they are ones that do not worship Jesus. They have not found a personal relationship with Jesus. And the Bible says they're lost. There are those that do not like that message, but that is what the Bible teaches and it's what we teach. And we in the Alliance have identified clusters of areas where we are currently working and emphasizing. And so we in the Alliance are working to bring the gospel around the world. That is our Did I lose sound? There I am. I think I put my hand in my pocket and hit a button. Okay. We in the Alliance have a strategy to build a church, to work with the church in a network, and that to continue to multiply the church of Jesus around the world. And I can honestly tell you that we do it well. And when you pray for Alliance mission missionaries in the Alliance work, and when you give faithfully, as I know many of you here give faithfully to the Great Commission Fund, you are a part of what God is doing around the world. You are helping lost people to gain access to the good news of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you one way that that, how that looks. My wife and I were transferred to work in the country of Peru in 1994 to work in a Bible seminary in the city of Trujillo. Trujillo is the second largest city in Peru, about a, nearly a million people. The Alliance had, had great success, we could call it success, I guess, in building the church in Lima with what they called the Encounter with God prog program. And they had already established large churches, mega churches, a seminary, and they wanted to multiply that out into the city of Trujillo. And so we arrived at the city of Trujillo, and, and we began to work, and we taught in the Bible seminary. And we were involved in a church plant, and, and then after 10 years, the Alliance came and said, our regional leader said, the church is strong. Somewhere a couple hundred thousand believers in Alliance churches in Peru. Large churches, some of them up 6,000, 7,000 people. It's a strong church. They were now running their own seminary. They were doing the work, and the Alliance said, they don't need missionaries anymore. In fact, staying too long probably wouldn't be good. And we as missionaries were not too pleased to hear that. We loved Peru. Our friends from Peru, the Peruvians were our friends. And we had to say goodbye and leave, and they transferred us to Costa Rica and Central America. And I arrived to Central America, 
And uh, the only, we were the only missionaries there. They gave us five countries to work in. They said, you're to help develop the church. It was kind of a vague thing. They said, they need help. Five countries, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. So I made a tour of the countries and began to get to meet the pastors. And and I compared it to what we had in Peru. And I realized we got a long way to go. One pastor by the name of Carlos, I went and spoke to Carlos. Carlos told me a story. As a new believer of about a month, as a new Christian, he was sent out to preach in a preaching point. So they told him how to get where he was going. I don't know how he ever found it because I never can. And he got out there and there was this little tin roof. And that was it. It was just a tin roof. There was no side, no walls. You don't need that in Nicaragua. It's like 190 degrees there anyway. So it was just a little tin roof. And he preached to his wife and one other person. And he went back the next week and the next week and the next week. And he became the pastor of, of a church. And there's a church there now working among in a community that's controlled by gangs and a big number of the people in the church are ex-gang members and some of them are gang members. And he's there sharing the gospel with them. And Carlos has never had the opportunity to study in a Bible institute, to have any kind of preparation. He's basically winging it the best he can. And I go to other places and I find the same thing. And, and I went back to my regional director. I said, we need help. There's no way I can do this all by myself. He said, we don't have anyone else. We don't have enough missionaries to go to all the places that we've already designated for missionaries. And then uh, we, had a, we did have an annual conference for our missionaries, or for our, our pastors in Central America, all Central America, they come together. And so, about four years ago, we invited Pastor Pepe Chavez. He's the pastor of the Lince Church in Lima, Peru. That's the mother church of the entire Encounter with God program. It's a, it's a congregation of about 6,000 people. And he was willing to come and be the speaker at our conference. And so when he was there, I talked to him because Pepe and I sat on the same committee together in, in Peru between the mission and the national church. And so I knew him a little bit, and I said, Pepe, is there any way Peru could help us? And Pepe said, yeah, I think so. And so a couple months later, he brought a team of the national church president. Uh, three of them were pastors of mega churches, the Bible Institute leader and uh, or director. And they went, traveled to a couple of the countries and looked around, and then we sat down together. And they said, Chuck, here's our assessment. You need a Bible seminary to train these people. And I said, I know, but how can I do a Bible seminary in five countries when it's just me? And Pepe looked at me and said, we want to do it. And my face must have shown the disbelief because Pepe looked at me and said, what's the matter? Why don't you think that's a good thing? I said, how are you going to, from Peru, start a Bible seminary in five countries? And he looked at me and he said, we can do it. We're a strong church. And so he described to me a plan. He said, we'll send in the professors for a couple of weeks. They'll, they'll teach in a couple of different countries. And our churches will support and send them to come and teach. And we will do a Bible seminary. And the last three years, Peruvian churches have sent professors. They've had six classes, six modules in each of our countries. Sending the professors, paying about $1,000 for each one of them for their travel. Come into our countries and train our pastors. I was with them a, few, a month ago, and the pastor said, we never knew that what we were teaching was heresy. 
Now we're teaching God's word. And now our churches are becoming strong and we're developing leadership. And you know what one of the most incredible things for me has been? Some of those students that I had in the Bible Seminary in Trujillo have now come to Central America to partner with me in teaching those seminary classes. You see, that's our strategy. That's the way we do it in the Alliance. And when you take part with us through your faithful prayer, your faithful giving, you are building a strong church, the church of Jesus around the world. Becky stood at the door of the church and listened. Well, it's not really a church. You see, it's a furniture store room. But Becky stood there and listened. Afterwards, she, they asked her, why didn't you come in? She said, well, I was a little bit late and I didn't want to interrupt anything. But maybe it was more the case of that for someone that lives in that class of society, the step across the threshold into an evangelical church is the most difficult step one could ever make. They've been taught what those evangelicals teach, that's a cult, that's false. And so she stood at the door and listened. The reason she was there was Tom, the missionary that replaced us for a year, he had gotten Becky into the English class that he was teaching about English. Becky was our first regular customer. She'd become a friend, and so she went to the English classes, and Tom had invited his English class to come and hear him preach. He was preaching his last message at that little church that we connected with in Escasu. And he invited his class. He said, I'm, I'm leaving. This is the last time I'll preach. Would you come and just listen? And some of the students came, and, and Becky went and listened. Becky knew the name of Jesus, but this was perhaps her first encounter of the clear message of Jesus Christ. She'd experienced Christian love from us in the coffee shop. We'd had conversations with her, and this was one more encounter with the gospel for Becky. Becky didn't receive Jesus that day. And on Thursday of that week, Tom and Tina boarded the plane and left for the U.S. for retirement. And we have no missionary in Costa Rica because we have no one there to send. And the question I have is who will be the one that will bring Becky her next encounter with the message of the salvation of Jesus Christ? Pastor Ryan. Each of us, we've heard what, what Chuck has had to share with us, and we just need to invite the Spirit to lead us as we pray. Um, and I certainly think it's necessary to be praying for Becky, be praying for Costa Rica. Um, you know, the Lord knows what is needed. And so let's join our hearts to pray together. So it'll be a little bit silent as we pray, and then I'll wrap us up, and uh, I'll probably invite the worship team to come at, at that time too. Let's pray.
Lord, hearing your work, the things that you're doing across this world, it lifts our spirits to know how we can be and perhaps have been involved through prayers and through giving. But yet we are left with the message that there's still so much to do. There's still so many people who have not yet said yes to you. And so, Lord, we pray we join our hearts together this morning. And we pray for Becky specifically, Lord, that you will send someone into her life that can be that next person to have that positive interaction as a Christian, as a follower of you, can help her on her walk to make that that choice, that statement, the decision to follow you. So we pray that you'll provide workers. We pray that you'll provide finances. And Lord, I'm, I'm asking that if there's anyone that's, that's with us this morning, and Lord, your Holy Spirit is, is speaking and nudging them in the direction that you're calling them to perhaps be someone that will go. Lord, I just pray that your Spirit will continue that leading, continue that prompting with the many young people that are here, and even those of a, a generation that perhaps we see, well, it's, uh, my time has passed. I don't know that that is true. So, Lord, we pray for your spirit, Lord, to move and to have your way in us. We pray for Chuck and for Robbie. We thank you for the ministry that they have had so many years together. We thank you for how you have brought healing into Robbie's body, that they can continue to, to serve you in this world, to continue to serve you as part of this Alliance family. So, Lord, as we enter into worship together, may your name be glorified and extolled in our hearts. May we acknowledge who you are. May we worship you as the majestic king of all kings, the giver of grace and the giver of mercy. And, Lord, may our hearts cry out to you that you will continue to draw other people to, your, to yourself to expand your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the hope that we have in him. Let's all stand together. As we close in worship to his name. Hope is here. Raise a shout to let all
and you are dismissed. Praise the Lord.